Okay. All right. So what's up, guys? Uh, my name is George Castellans. For those of you guys that don't know me, um, so I am a broker here in Rawway. I'm opening up the Rawway office. Um, more of my background, though, before all of this was actually government. So I, um, I've been on zoning boards and redevelopment agencies for a while. So um, I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about planning and zoning. So uh, this, what I'm going to share with you guys is actually Rutgers. Uh, they do... Anytime somebody gets uh, onboarded to be on a zoning board or a planning board, Rutgers does a mandatory training for any member to know what they're dealing with. And so this is kind of the presentation that, that any board member has to go through. Um, I'm going to go into it, but I'm not going to give you guys all of it because it's it can be very intense, very involved. I'm just going to go through pretty much the highlights and I think what's important to you guys as real estate agents. Um, it also has some stuff to do with Florida, but it's a little different with Florida. It's going to be some of the codes, obviously it's town by town. And then some of the differences in Florida have to do with the process. So I'll give you one quick example in New Jersey. If you get an approval from one board, you get that board. And then that board has another month to get a second hearing where if they want to make it, change it, they can do it that way. Um, whereas in Florida, they really just have a uh, first hearing from the planning board or zoning board, and then the second hearing goes to city council. So some would say and argue that Florida is a little harder because you're dealing with two separate boards. Um, so the board in New Jersey is appointed by the mayor, and it's nine people. Um, if it's a zoning board, uh, planning board could be less or more, depending on the size as well. Um, my municipality, for example, we have a joint board. We have both planning and zoning is the same group of people uh, with the exception that when we act as a planning board, elected officials can be on there. When we act as a zoning board, no elected officials could be on there. So the mayor is always on the planning board by default. And so is a councilman. It's like one of the classes that, that get appointed. But when we act as a zoning board, no elected official could be on it. So I'm going to go into the details, but I'm not going to give you the nitty gritty. I'm just going to tell you how does it affect you as a realtor and how can you use this information to provide value for your clients? Um, I'll ask everybody to mute themselves. Uh, I'll stop in, in between and I'll ask if you guys have any specific questions. Uh, but again, let's, let's not get too carried away with the presentation. I'm going to at the end kind of wrap it up and tell you what it means to you as an agent. So um, the overview of the course when we take it is to talk about planning. So you guys have probably heard of planning, right? It's a common word that gets thrown around, but the idea is like, what is a municipal planner? That's an actual job, it's a title. Every municipality has it. I'll go into that. Every municipality has what's called a master plan. You guys should get familiar. If you guys are like the Rawway agent, the Fort Lee agent, the whatever agent you are, you should get familiar with the city's master plan because it gets revised every 10 years and it tells you what the intent of the city is. So I'll give you a quick example when we get in there, but essentially Rawway at one point decided, you know what, we're going to do apartments. So if you see downtown Rawway, you have a lot of apartments. And when they decided to do that, they removed all the zoning for multifamily homes. So right now, any two families or three families or four families that exist in Rawway are what's called pre-existing non-conforming. You cannot build a new two family by zone because as a master plan, the city decided we're not going to do these types of homes because we're going to be building all these apartments. So it's a really important thing for you guys to understand the master plan of the city that you guys are working in. I'm also going to talk about zoning and subdivision, which is one of the biggest ways that we as real estate agents can provide value for our clients. When you talk about subdivisions, if you find yourself a big acre lot and you know you look at the requirements and say, okay, I only need, let's say 5,000 square feet to build a home in this city, I can divide that acre and potentially do 10 houses, right? So then that's how you can provide value to a client because let's say there's a house that's all beat up, it's 350 grand, but it's on an acre lot. And then you could build, let's say 10, $500,000 homes. That's how you figure out how to provide value for your clients. So I'll go into that. Boardsmanship, I'm not going to talk about because that's specifically as it relates to board members. Um, and then you have the zoning and planning review. I'm going to go into these things, but again, only as it relates to us as realtors. So part one is what is planning and what, why do we do it? Um, I'm not going to go through the funny stuff. They try to be cute with the little memes, but what is planning? So planning is essentially trying to put action with foresight. So if you say, you know what, I want to make this city into this, that's a great idea. But the only way that you're possibly going to get there is if you actually put a plan together. That's what the master plan is. So like I was saying with you guys before, if the city wants to say, you know what, I'm going to focus on only big homes. 
Um, and I don't know if you guys remember, but there was this big case in New Jersey to be a real estate agent. This is one of the things that you have to learn. It's about Lawrenceville. Essentially, this municipality said, you know what? I want to keep poor people out. So they ended up making it so that the lots had to be big. So if you want to do a home in, in this city, all your lots had to be big. But the, the court actually ruled that that was unconstitutional because what you were doing is essentially excluding people from purchasing homes. So this is an idea where it could be used in a negative way, but there are also ways to be used in a positive. Um, so essentially, I would recommend if you guys work in any city and you want to be the main person in your city, get to know the master plan. I'll help you pull it up. And if you have any questions, sometimes there's a lot of sections to it. Um, so break it down and, and learn about it a little bit. Sit down with people and ask them questions about it. If you want to go over it with me, I'll be happy to explain what those things are. You guys have heard of zoning and what the different zone codes are. Master plan is when you could also redo your zoning map. So the city will take their map and say, okay, this section is going to be commercial, right? This is where we want all the warehouses. Because if not, let's say somebody buys a piece of land and they want to build a, a warehouse right next to residential. You know, that's going to crash the values of the residential homes. So the city, what they do is they create zones and say, this is what we want here. And this is what we don't want. And they have allowed uses and permitted uses, conditional uses. There's a lot of nitty gritty to it, but that's very important to understand. Um, any questions at this point from anybody here or there? No, pretty straightforward, right? That's what planning is. Um, so you get a comprehensive master plan. The actual definition by law is a comp a composite of one or more written or graphic proposals for the development of your municipality. So most master plans come with a written statement as well as a, unit, a drawing. So um, Broadway just did one for the downtown. So the master plan can even be done for the whole city or you could just renew the master plan you had 10 years ago. You don't have to really change it. If you want to just change one section, you can change one section of your master plan. So now what they what the city says is, you know what, we have a lot of apartments, but we want more businesses, more businesses and we want more green space. So that changes the focus. There was a piece of land downtown where they were looking at developing apartments. But now the master plan, when they did it, they're like, you know what, I think we're missing this. That like kids need space to hang out. We need some greenery. Like we don't want it to be all concrete. So then because of that, the master plan changed. So now the priority for that lot is like, you know what, we're not going to do apartments here anymore. We're going to do a park. So it's important to understand the priorities of the city because with us real estate agents, as we're looking for opportunities for our clients, if the city doesn't want any more apartments, you got to understand that because then it doesn't make sense for them to buy, right? So that's that. Um, master plan concerns with physical, economical, and social development of the city. This is one of those things I was just saying, like sometimes you prioritize the parks because not because of the economics, right? That's not going to make money. It's tax exempt. It's not building you in any revenue, but from the social development of the city, that's kind of important. Right. Some people want to live where kids have places to, to run and play. So these are factors that to be considered in, in planning um, the process. I'm not going to get into because it's very technical and we don't really have to do that. Um, I can do a follow up training to this. If any of you guys, this is kind of one of the things I want to say at the end. But if any of you guys want to get involved with planning, I can help reach out to the chairman of your board and say, look, I have somebody who's an agent with me and they're interested in helping develop the city. They live in your town. Next time there's an opening, would you consider appointing them to the board? Right. So that's something that you guys could do and start getting involved. It's not too time consuming if you don't want it to be. When I was a regular member, I just attended one meeting a month. I heard out the case. Then we voted on it. Spent about two hours a month. It's not that much. When you're the chairman, it's a lot more because I have to do pre meetings. I have to do a lot of site visits. I have to do a lot of stuff. But just being a regular member, you can get a lot. And then you actually have input and you know what's happening in your city before anybody does. So this is if you guys want to do a second training, if anybody's interested in actually becoming a board member, we can do a second training where I can break you know, go into this a little bit more and then you'll have to do the mandatory reports anyway. So um, we could do that. So uh, purpose of planning is you, uh, it's mandated in some states. Most places like New Jersey say you have to have a plan for your city. You can't just have Wild Wild West out there. You, you got to develop a plan. So that's here. Um, it gives the local officials the big picture. So everybody on the council gets together and decides, okay, this is what we want for the city. We have the big picture. And then you obviously go spot by spot in individual municipalities. Allows for coordination. You know what's allowed and what's not allowed. You have a pretty good idea of coordinating your projects based on what the master plan says. It involves the public. Whenever you're doing a master plan, there's public hearings. There's usually two or three. And the public comes out and they say, oh, you know, we don't want any more warehouses or we don't want more apartments. And there's that back and forth. So that's a very involved process. And it guides public regulations and investments into it. Now, here's one of the things that most agents don't understand. I just listed a property and I have agents call me and you could tell most agents know nothing about zoning or planning or nothing. Planning versus zoning. You guys know that it's two separate boards. You've probably heard that's two separate boards, but some people think it's just one thing. So when do you go to planning versus when do you go to zoning? All right. So let's take a look at it. 
Planning is about systemic and orderly development of the community. It's about what you want and how to get there, right? The zoning part is about the regulations of the buildings and the structures in the land. So planning is more about the intent of the use and how you're going to do it, whereas zoning is the specifics. So what's the width of the lot? What's the maximum height? What are the variances that might be needed uh, if you want to develop this type of structure? Um, planning has to do with land use, community facilities, transportation, housing, environment. It's very encompassing. It's, it's a much broader idea, uh, whereas zoning deals with the present conditions. So what's actually there and what are you trying to change individually? It's, it's more down to the ground. Um, and the planning looks to the future, whereas the zoning addresses what can be built now. So you always try to put what planning board is planning ahead. Another way to think about it, when you get into more details, planning, we call it the yes board and zoning is the no board. Planning is if you're, if you want to do something and you're allowed to do it, like, yes, you can do it, but you need to get permission on how to do it. Then you go to planning. Zoning is when you can't do what you want to do. So right now I was building a three family house and it's in a one family zone. So the thing with that is I need to go to the zoning board because I need permission to be able to do something I'm not supposed to be doing there, right? And zoning is always the toughest board. You're always going to hear that. When you're looking at it for your clients, you have to explain to them. Zoning, by default, you can't do what you want to do. Planning, they allow what you want. It's just they need to have input in how you're going to do it. So that's, a, that's the biggest distinguishing factor of the two. There's a lot of other reasons. Um, for example, and we're not going to get into the types, but there's like C variances, which are not as heavy as what we call D variances. D variances have to do with the use of the property. So the use is one family, two family, three family, commercial, mixed use. Those are the uses. If you're trying to change the use, that's a big hurdle. By default, they don't want that because they already said this is what we're planning in this area, right? Whereas planning is, OK, I want to subdivide these 10 lots and I'm allowed to. But the plan, the planning guidelines say that each lot has to be a minimum of 5,000 square feet. You have to have a minimum of 50 width in the front, 100. And I'm just throwing numbers. That's what it is usually here. But every city has different sizes. So that's kind of the difference between planning and zoning. Any questions about that specifically? No. All right. Um, I'm not going to deal with the legislation because, again, that this gets very specific into what statutes and all that stuff. You guys don't have to know that. Um, Rulemaking, we don't have to deal with too much. The departments that there are state agencies that influence. So you guys might have heard of the NJDEP, the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. They over like they put their own guidelines, even though it's a state agency. If you're trying to build on waterfront, it doesn't matter what city you're in. The first thing you got to deal with is the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection guidelines, and then you could deal with the local zoning. So if your municipality says, you know what, you could build up to you know 10 feet away from your property line. But the DEP says, no, I want you to be set back 100 feet from any water line. Guess what? That's what's going to govern. So it's very important if you're dealing with specifically, and I say DEP because they're the ones that are the harshest. If you're dealing with any property that has anything about wetlands, um, floods or waterways, anything like that, look. don't even look at your local first. Look always at the state. It's always going to be case by case. That's one of the good things about Land use, it's always case by case. It's also one of the more challenging things because people don't really get into that as much. Um, the master plan, I feel like I gave you guys a pretty good understanding of what a master plan does. Um, I don't have to really go into this, but this is an idea or a look at what a master plan looks like. So let me zoom in here. This is uh, Ewing Township. So you'll probably, how many of you guys have ever pulled up a zoning map for a city? Right, you guys have seen how it's like color coded and like there's different things. So there's, um, you'll see here that there's all these different pockets and then here you have the key. So you'll look and say, I would just normally Google map an address and see where it is. Then I find it on the map and let's say it's here and it's red, I go to the key and I see, okay, that's commercial, right? But then in commercial, there's differences between commercial, industrial, heavy industrial. So commercial could just be stores, restaurants, right? Uh, offices. But commercial could also be industrial stuff like warehousing, but there, some municipalities break it down differently. So every municipality has its own key. You have to look at those keys. Um, I'm, I want to do a workshop to follow this and say, all right, let's look at one property and see what can be built there. And then actually go through the process of figuring it out. But this is just an idea of how it would look. So that's, that's pretty much how they did their master plan. Um, the elements that always go into, into consideration is housing, right? That's number one thing. Um, 
circulation, meaning roads and, and bridges and things like that. So sometimes with cities up north or like where you have the tunnels or bridges, that's always a huge factor because if they want to take property away to and they want to emphasize transportation, they'll that's the priority for them. They don't want more apartment buildings. They want better transportation. So they can remove entire blocks of houses just to build wider roads. So that it's a very important to understand that stuff. Recreation facilities, all these different factors have to do with master plans. So um, I'll send you guys an email with this if you guys want to look a little bit more into it, but we don't have to. This is what I talked a little bit about other requirements. Um, if you have a master plan for a district, for example, in Secaucus, you guys have the Meadowlands zone. So Secaucus is its own zoning, but if you're inside the Meadowlands zone, that's a separate zone. It's what's called an overlay zone. Right? It gets really complicated. Here in Rawway, we have our main zoning map, and then we have the downtown has a special improvement district where you have overlays. And it could be a good thing, it could be a bad thing. The good thing about special improvement zones is it gives you more flexibility. So if we're talking about investors, you want to buy in special improvement zones. One of the biggest benefits is that they want development there. They did a study and said this area needs to be developed. So it gives the board special power to do beyond what you could do with zoning regularly. So I'll give you an example. How many of you guys have heard of pilots? Pilot agreements. Yeah. So pilot agreements are payment. Uh, how can I help you? Uh, Sorry. Oh, let me come in. Or just... Yeah, you can come in. Sure, sure. Is it regarding like your, I don't know, property managing? Pilot agreements? No, they're um, payment in lieu of what? taxes. So it's essentially when you have a when you have a property that wants to be developed, but the cost is going to be very expensive. So what the municipality says, you know what? It's going to be expensive for you to develop this. So we'll give you a deal. If you build this building, you'll be paying about 100K in taxes a year. So what we're going to do is we're going to cut a deal with you. We're going to do a pilot instead of taxes. You can pay 50K over the next five years, and you'll pay 100K over the last year six to 10. So let me just mute. Guys, please mute yourself if you're not. Uh, where is that? Participants? All right, I think it stopped. Um, so a pilot agreement is a benefit to the developer because you're essentially saying, look, I'm buying the land for X amount and I'm building it for this much and it doesn't make sense for me to do it. But you as the city want me to develop this, right? So cut me a break. It's going to cost me 50 million to build it. Give me a $50 million pilot. And what they'll do is they'll, they'll calculate your tax bill and they'll say, this is how we can do it so that it's not such a burden. They're usually five-year pilots, 10-year pilots. Sometimes like Jersey Gardens, Mo and Elizabeth, they got a 30-year pilot. Because there's a huge development, they have uh, contamination, all this stuff. So the city can negotiate agreements to give money back instead of the, the uh, owner paying taxes. They get that money. They get to keep that money from revenue. It's one of the biggest benefits. Yes. Similar to an abatement. It is kind of like an abatement. Um, so the new construction abatements are the most popular, but those are like statewide. They're given by default. Like, look, for five years, you're only going to pay taxes on the land and not the building. That's a great analogy to it. That's a statewide thing. This is more like individual specific areas. And it's really up to the discretion of the city. That's why the mayors are very important in this process because the city could say yes or no. It just depends on how bad they want your project. So one of the things that I kind of want you all to understand after getting out of all of this is there are regulations that are written, but there's a lot of conversations that can be had. Even though the laws or the rules are written as such, doesn't mean you can't do it. You just need approval. That's why these boards exist. The zoning says you can't build a three family in this area. But if I go and try to talk and say, hey, would you guys be amenable to this? And they say, yes, I can go to the board and get my appeal. What a lot of people don't understand is they usually read the zoning law and they say, okay, I can't do anything here. And then they walk away from the deal. What I want you guys to understand is read the zoning, but then let's have conversations because you might be able to pick up a deal for your client or yourselves that other people wouldn't because they thought that they could only build you know, I'll give you a perfect example. I won't say the address, but there's a property here in, in Rawway. Some agent from another broker, she picked it up and she was trying to sell it and she was trying to develop it. But the, the way it's written, um, you could only have three units. I went through the process and did my due diligence and I found that I could actually do like 26 units. Huge difference, right? Because if you're going to sell that piece of property to somebody and everybody thinks you can only do three. Now, it's not a guarantee, right? You have to go through a process and approvals and all that. But just knowing that information and knowing how to ask those questions is going to make you hugely valuable to your clients. So that, that's pretty much the nitty gritty of it. Any other questions about that? All right, so I'll go down to the next one. Um, the requirements make it so that you have to have fair housing. This is another component that not a lot of people understand. Um, 
Affordable housing is a thing in New Jersey. By law, every municipality has to have a certain amount of affordable housing. But affordable housing isn't necessarily cheap. What affordable housing is in, let's say, Newark or Irvington is not the same as affordable housing in Westfield or, you know, Fairlawn, right? These, the, when you're more expensive, let's say your mortgage on average in a location like that, your average home value is, let's say, 800 grand. Affordable could mean $3,000 a month in rent. Whereas affordable is not the same in a place like Irvington, right? So with the Fair Housing Act of 1985, there's a certain amount of units and it's, it, there's a calculation. I'm not really going to go into the formula, but if the municipality is under the amount of affordable units, every development that you do might be mandated to have affordable units in it. So I'll give you an example. Uh, Roseau Park, where I'm the chair of the board, what we do is if you're coming to the board, I'm always going to try, let's say you want to build a building and it has 20 units. I'm always going to try to get at least 10% of affordable units there. That's important for you to know, because if your client wants to do market rate apartments and you're calculating $2,500 a month for each unit, and then you found out that five of those units have to be affordable, that could really change the equation. So a Rawway, on the other hand, has no affordable housing issue because Rawway built a lot of senior housing, a lot of Section 8 housing. There's a lot of sections that are specifically developed for that housing. And because it's not a huge city, you could build 100 units and they could all be market rate. But that's another factor. Every municipality has a ratio. And you should always ask if the city is up to par with their required affordable housing. If they are not, understand that your project might be required to include affordable housing. And that's OK. A lot of like, for example, I'll give you a creative way that we did something here in Raleigh. Um, some people shy away from affordable housing because you think, you know, tenants are not going to take care of the units and all that stuff, but there are ways to get creative. For example, senior housing is affordable housing, right? You can make a requirement that if to live there, you have to be 65 and over or 62, 52, whatever you want to do. It could be affordable housing, but designated to a specific group because that fulfills the need. Another uh, idea that we had, we're an arts city. So what we did is we developed uh, a, uh, things like 42 units on the other side of town, and we made it so that you have to be a part of an art guild. So if you're an artist, like a actor, writer, if you're an artist and registered to a guild, you can live in those units and they're affordable. They're subsidized by the state. So again, there's many ways to get creative. So don't let it stop you. If you do have to do affordable, see if you could do, let's say, the first floor for senior housing. Right. And that's pretty much guaranteed money, too. Yes. No. Oh, um, we could get into that a little bit more, but that's very specific to different cities. Um, master plan, I think we've beat that pretty much uh, down. We, we have that down pack. I'm gonna move on to the next section. Preparing the master plan and the process of it, you guys don't really have to know. Um, the hearing process, this is uh, definitely an important portion. So one of the big things is that not only is it you might need approvals, you got to take into consideration the amount of time that it might take you to get these approvals. So zoning boards typically only hear a handful of applications per night. So if you go to a city like Elizabeth, you might be waiting two, three months to get on the agenda. And it might take you three months to get all the application complete. Whereas if you go to somewhere like um, Union, Union Township, what they do, they do weekly zoning board meetings. So if you're a zoning board member there, you have to go weekly, but they have less uh, applications per week. Uh, Piscataway does two a month. They do the small applications in the like second Thursday and they do the big applications in the fourth Thursday. So there are different cities that do it in different ways, but that is an important uh, thing. You have to learn the processes. Um, when you go to have a hearing, you have to publish it in the newspaper at least 10 days before. A lot of times you'll have to hire an attorney and they're going to walk you through this whole process, but you have to publish it in the newspaper because if there's a neighbor that doesn't like your plan, they get to come out and protest against it. It's a public process. Now, just because somebody doesn't like it and they come to complain about it doesn't mean that your project is going to be shut down. You have an important proof, which is to say, my project does more good than bad. So yes, we understand that you might not like this project because you don't want your street parking to be taken away, but there's also a need for housing here. And this is what I'm trying to provide, you know, housing for the area. And I have plenty of parking in my own lot. So there's a lot of arguments that you can make. So don't be, you know, too discouraged by that. Um, you also have to notify the clerks of the municipalities around it. So your project doesn't only uh, impact, for the most part, your city. It also impacts other municipalities because sometimes you have joint services. For example, let's say the fire department from one city covers fire in your city. And when you're building a building there, that's going to affect their fire department. So they have to be notified as well. Again, these are things that your attorney is really going to be involved with, but it's good for you guys to know. 
The last thing is that the counties usually have their own planning. And they usually only affect county roads, but anything that affects other cities, the county wants to know about it. And even if they don't have jurisdiction, they'll give you a letter that says, uh, we have no objection to this, or we don't have any jurisdiction, continue. And the board needs to see that. So these are just some of the items that you have to be uh, keep in mind of how it affects. Re-examination is what I told you guys about. Every 10 years, every municipality is supposed to re-examine their, their master plan. Because every 10 years, like as the census changes and people get those numbers, they, they're like, okay, we were a small town. Let's say now we're growing. Now, maybe we don't care so much about one family homes. Maybe we need to designate some areas to be two family, three families, right? Those are the types of thoughts that go into uh, re-examinations. Any questions so far? No, um, we don't do capital improvement. You don't have to know about that specifically. I can roll a little bit. No, no, I'll, I'll there we go. All right, so zoning and subdivision. Um, <clears throat> so the subdivision process is probably one of the biggest things that we deal with as realtors. So zoning will usually regulate the use. So what are you going to use the property for? What's called the bulk variances, which is, I'm sorry, just keep getting. Put this on do not disturb. Um, you're going to also regulate the bulk variances. So bulk variances are going to be like, okay, your setbacks. So you need to have, let's say, 10 feet on each side of setback from the property line. So you need a survey and you say, okay, I, I can't build within 10 feet of this side and 10, 10 feet of this side. Also on the front, based on the area, the biggest thing with zoning, you try to conform. You try to keep things uniform. So if houses, you guys have all seen houses where the house, the properties are built right up to zero lot line. They're all the way to the front. And then you've seen houses where all of them have front yards. So what zoning does is they look at the regular. So if you go through a neighborhood, you normally won't see every house with 20 foot setbacks. And then you don't see one house up on, on the curb. That's by design. Zoning tries to keep the, the conformity and the uniformity of the neighborhood. Yes. So if you're making a single family home to a duplex, now you're building right next to it. Would that be grandfathered in or will it have to be the new laws or whatever? Yeah. So if you're building something new, it's going to be whatever the new laws are. But if you're adding to what, what's already been existing there, would that be grandfathered in? No. Would so I that's to start the same or do I have to go back? No. So any, any expansion of a non-conforming use is not allowed. You would need zoning permission. So that's a great question because, for example, I had a house I did in Verona and the house did not meet the setback because it was kind of like it was a it was a lot that went like catty corner, like it went diagonally and the house was a little rotated. So the corner of the property was like four feet from the property line, but the setback requirement is five feet. So I was trying to do a second floor. It was a ranch. Right. So when I wanted to do the second floor, the zoning got denied because you can't expand on that. The second floor can't be in that four foot mark. So I had to set it back upstairs, even though the first floor was already encroaching on the four feet, the upstairs couldn't encroach there. So it, it created a situation. They're very picky about that because, you know, they, they understand that it's grandfathered in. They're not going to make you remove a foot of your house, but they're not going to allow you to expand upon it. Yeah. So that's important to know. The other uh, thing that you should know is any grandfathered use, when you redo more than 50 percent of it, you lose it. So it's important to understand so you can tell your, your clients if they're buying a two family in Rawway and there's no two family zones and let's say they want to knock down that second floor and do it taller or do, you know, whatever. If it's 50 percent, you lose the use. So you technically have to go to the board. So it's important to understand these these things. Really, it's not our job per se, but if you are first in it, if you can speak to it, your clients are just going to love you and you're going to get more business because they're like, you know what? Next one, I want you to find. I want you to do it. Uh, yes, we have a question. Mohammed. Yes, I have a question. Uh, so uh, for some time, like we see it's adult only, like um, uh, 50 plus uh, housing area or something like that, that comes under zoning? Um, it could, but it doesn't have to. So uh, most municipalities don't say, okay, here's where all the seniors are gonna go. They don't do that in their zoning. But the mm -hmm. building itself will have a, a deed or a master like deed that regulates it and they will have their own individual. It's like, let's say you are a landlord of a 10 unit apartment. You can have your own requirements as long as they don't violate the law against discrimination. You are making your own rules, but they're not the municipal rules. So it's, it's not really the city that's saying that you can't do that. But um, let's say you were going to the board and say, I want to put a senior housing here. 
and there happens to be a nightclub right next to it, the board's probably going to deny you because they don't, they think that's going to be a nuisance and it's not the best use of that property. That's kind of the role of the board is to say, okay, I see what you're trying to do, but I don't think it makes too much sense. So I'm not, you know, we're not going to allow that. Or they might suggest to you doing something different. Um, that's the point of the board. They might not just deny you flat out, but they can give you conditions to your approvals. So that's a good question, Mohammed. Um, no, gotcha. it's not really set by the board, but they do have a, a say in, in the development. I cool. see, I see. And uh, another question. So being part of the board, it's a volunteer thing or you're gonna be paid for it or something like that? No, How it's a volunteer. Happen? It's definitely a volunteer position. I wish it was paid, um, but no, it's, it's a volunteer position. Yeah. And you do awesome. it, um, you, you do it as like, it's a community service kind of thing. What are um, the requirements? Uh, you have to get appointed by the mayor. Um, you have to be at least 18 years old and you have to do the state uh, the state requirement. Now, every mayor might have different requirements. Like in a city, they might want you to be a, live in the city for X amount of years. You have to live in the resident in the town that you want to be on the board. So that might be a requirement, but that's really more to the discretion of the municipality. Technically, by law, it's very simple. But to get appointed, the mayor doesn't have to appoint just anybody. So it does require you to like be involved somehow. I'm from oh, perfect. Well, neighbors. <laughs> we'll get you a point in this yeah. one. So yeah, that's uh, that's one of them. So moving on to the zoning, um, we have the use, the bulk, the setback, signage. This is a very important thing. People don't know, but your signage is regulated by the boards. You can't just actually Rosa Park. We had a neighbor. I'm not sure if you saw. They had a bunch of obscene signs about like against Biden, and like they were right by a school, elementary school. So right. kids were walking to school and seeing like f this, and and you know you can't do that. We have rules for zoning. You can't just put these types of languages. So that it does regulate signage as well. For businesses, your signs are regulated by the city. So the, biz, the city might say, okay, your signs can't exceed four inches in lettering, or they can't be backlit, or whatever it is. It, there's, it's all regulated. So if you're dealing with commercial um, uh, clients, that is an important factor for you as well. Um, so signs, height, height is one of the biggest things because obviously sometimes you want to build stories when you're talking about um, big developments, you want to build most stories and parking is another factor which is on here too. Let's say a lot of people do these builds where you do first floor parking and then above it apartments, but if you're doing your whole first floor of parking, let's say you want to do more apartments, but the height is capped at 35 feet, you could theoretically only get three stories out of it. So that's another factor. You have to know the height requirements, the parking. That one of the biggest things right now, especially in Broadway, is parking. So before, back in the day, most households had one car. Nowadays, you have two or three. Here, up north, like Jersey City, maybe you don't because most people commute or where you have like close access. The zoning might be different based on where you are. If you are close access to like a shuttle or a jitney or the path or whatever it is, parking might not be so important because they know that people are going to be mostly commuters. But if you're in a you know residential area, they're gonna want to make sure that you have parking so that people don't be parking on the streets and causing problems. So these are the types of things that it gets very specific to what you're dealing with. But these are the considerations. If you guys don't understand the considerations, you're not gonna be able to advise your client properly. So next time you see a property and they say, Oh, I want to build you know a five-story building, now you can say, Well, let's look at the zoning and see what the max height is. You know, that's that's the types of things that you will show your value as an agent. Landscaping, that's the thing that is actually you would. I spend so much time on the board hearings dealing with landscaping. It's annoying. Like I know the species of trees that I shouldn't even know, but it's a big thing now. Like if you're doing a renovation, like right now uh, uh, on my three family, I have to put in three trees because that's, there's like a code where if you, you know, if you're doing your construction, they want you to have shade trees, uh, shade trees. So it's like, it's, and then it has to be a certain species of them. it's, it's nuts. Wow. Yeah. So you have to, you have to keep that in mind. Like if, um, the drainage and the coverage, to me, those are the biggest surprises. When I started dealing with landscaping, drainage is hugely important. You can't overdevelop your lot. For example, every single lot has a maximum coverage requirement. So when you're buying a lot and it's 10,000 square feet and they say you can only cover up to 50%. So now you're, even though you have a huge lot, you just cut that in half or you usable space because of those requirements. These are all very important factors. Yeah, it's, it's like, I'm gonna show you once we're done, I'm gonna, I wanna show you an actual example of like, how, how do you even find this stuff out? Like, where is it? I'll show you how to get it. I'll show you how to interpret it. Some of it is more complex and we'll have to do it case by case, but that's the point. I want you to have the context now and then we'll get into the details a little later. Okay, any questions on this? Yes, George, Yes. Uh, quick question. If you provide a drainage system, can you then use more of the space on the lot? 
That's a great question. So if I want to build on 70% of the lot, but I'm only allowed 50%, you need a variance because you're varying away from what's required. So when I get to the board, how do I defend my argument? I can say to the board, yes, you know, Madam Chair, Mr. Chair, I am doing 70%, but that extra 20% that I'm taking away, I'm going to build a retention system under underground. And that is a thing that I've done. Like, um, there's also, because technically uh, pavement is covering your lot. So if you're going to do a parking lot and you have, you have the parking exceeding that 50% or whatever it is, there's actually a uh, pervious uh, asphalt that you could do now. So you could do a driveway and even you could park on it and it's not impervious. So there are creative ways to go about it. So on the application, it'll say you're taking up 70% of space, but 20% of that is actually pervious pavement. And because yeah. of that, the drainage is impacted. So that's a great question. Yes, you is can be very creative. That, no, no, that's, that's excellent. Thank you. But is that a specific type of uh, driveway, like a specific material that will not be considered as, you know, impervious versus pervious coverage? Yeah, absolutely. So regular asphalt is pervious. You, uh, you cannot, it, it doesn't drain, right? The water sits uh -huh. on it and drives away. There are specific driveways made of certain material that are pervious and the water will, will it's more porous. Uh, it's more expensive, but let's say that gives you the extra parking for another 10 units, then it's right. probably worth the price. Right. It's all a cost factor. Another thing that I just um, dealt with on, on my board that was very interesting is um, you could do green roofs. Now, if you do green roofs that actually soak up and redistribute the water, that counts as impervious. So you can have a whole lot. But if the whole roof is green, you're actually not affecting your drainage. So this is the type of thing like I would advise you guys, like go to your next board meeting and hear the arguments, hear what the application is about. And, and you can actually learn a lot of like creative ideas. So when you have that lot that comes up for sale and the seller says, oh, damn, but I can't because I can't cover more than X amount. You say, oh, you know what? You could actually do it. It might be a little more expensive, but if we do a green roof, we can get this benefit. Interesting. So yeah, that, that, George, one last question. If, yeah. if I'm. Yeah. Go so ahead. How does zoning affect whether or not you're allowed to. Um, build a basement or not in an area is that a zoning thing or is that a planning thing um so yes and no um it's really more of a of a code thing the main thing that affects basements is what's called egress right so when you have egress you have to have windows that are a certain size um but god forbid there's a fire and a fireman has to come in the calculation is yeah, on the first floor or any floor that's ground level, the opening of the window has to be five square feet uh, in, yeah. in, or I'm sorry, five feet in width. If you're on an upstairs window, it has to be like 5.4 feet. There's a very specific calculation. Um, if you don't have that in the basement, then you can't have a li livable space because of life safety. That's more of a uh, life safety issue than a zoning. Um, when it affects the zoning is some locations, for example, here in downtown, you're allowed to have apartments, but only on the second level because they want, they don't want like living rooms as you're going from like one store and then a living room. So zoning might regulate that you can only have residential second floor and higher, right? So that sometimes you have zoning requirements for that. But for the most part, I think what you're getting at is more of a life safety thing. Um, you could have a basement and modify the window with permission from the board and make that into a livable unit. But Here's what zoning might get into it. If it's a two family and you want to make that three, that basement, a third unit, now you need a use variance. If your house is a two family in a two family zone and you're changing it to a three, now you need a use variance. You get me? So it's kind of tricky because any question you might ask me, there might be a whole different host of answers to it. Thank you, man. No problem. Um, Structure and contents, we're, we're not going to get into so much right now. I'm going to show you an example, and I'll sh actually show you how it's written, and you'll see that. Um, this section here, this is an important one. Uh, in Plainfield, for example, there's a historic preservation area. Montclair has one, too. There's a lot of cities that have those historic zones. That is the biggest nightmare you could deal with from zoning because you have your zoning, and then you have the historic preservation. And essentially, people don't even want to change the facade. Of a, like in Montclair or Plainfield, if you want to change the siding, forget it. <laughs> you know, it's the, it's, it's a whole nother process. So be aware that zoning is a main thing, but there are overlay zones. Like I talked about special improvement zones and uh, Meadowland zone. There's also historic preservation zones. So be aware of the local and be aware of the overlays. Okay. Floodplain regulations. That's a big thing. The New Jersey DEP just announced two weeks ago, they're changing the height. 
Before, for you to build, you had to be plus one elevation from a flood zone. So if you look at flood zones, um, let's say I, I actually I'm building uh, like three blocks from here. So on West Main, we are at plus 14, which is where plus 14 feet from the river, right? The flood elevation that FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, determined that you have to be at plus 18. So now whatever I'm going to build, I have to build a base to 18 plus one. They just came out with a regulation saying, you know what, because flooding is getting worse, now you have to be plus three rather than plus one. So now it changes things because guess what? Your height, it might be capped. So if you're at 35 and you have to elevate five, you only have 30. There's a lot of like, it gets really into it. That's yeah. counting the basement or like what you mean? Dude, like the floor of the basement, the footing of the basement. Anything you build in a flood zone has to be, used to be plus one, now it has to be plus three. So the bare base of your building has to be plus three feet above the elevation of whatever it is. And that's why, um, for example, uh, one of my friends just built a house down the shore. And what they do down there is you have to do these pilings, right? Because you, you have to pretty much put your house on stilts. And there's regulations as to what the flow of water under it. So if you build your house on stilts, you can't build something under the house because it, it'll stop water. So they have special sheetrock that's breakable sheetrock. If water were to push, it would just knock the sheetrock right out. So cosmetically, it's nice because you can use the room. But if there's a flood, it can't prevent the water. So there's special regulations when it comes to that, too. And there's special materials. What I'm trying to get at is that there are regulations, but most agents give up there if they even know how to look them up. But if your client says to you, oh, I like this lot a lot, but I saw that we can't do this because of this. If you're equipped with the knowledge to say, oh, but there is such a thing as this, you will be so valuable to your client. So th these are the types of conversations that we have. And this is kind of why I like it so much is because I learn stuff from other developers that then now I can, you know, give my consulting to other clients. Another thing I do, and obviously it takes a lot of years. I've been a board member for almost 10 years now. Um, I am a land use consultant. So I have clients that pay me a monthly retainer to consult on their projects. So that's another stream of income for me. And essentially it's like, it doesn't require me to do showings and stuff like that. They just call me and it's like, yo, I want to do this. What can I do here? And then for my expertise, I say, this is what we can do. That's something that you guys can develop for yourselves if you start getting into this route. So always be thinking of new ways to make money within real estate. That's, that's the beautiful part about it. Um, senior housing, I spoke about a little bit. Development rights. Um, development rights is an important one. I'm not going to get into it too much, but it is, it is important for us. Um, in municipalities that have special improvement districts, for example, like Rawway, if you own the properties, you can apply to be the designated developer of a zone. So let's say you, 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 you don't own everything on the block, but the city likes what your project is. You can be designated as the developer and nobody else could develop that project but you. That's like a huge thing. So that's like, uh, it, it could be hard to do it, but if, if you do it, essentially it almost guarantees that you're gonna get the property either because the seller will have to sell for you or they might even go through eminent domain and take the property and you just give them fair market value. That huge deals get done this way where like you try to buy them, but even if they don't wanna sell, nobody else could develop it. You have the exclusive rights to develop. Then let's say you get the exclusive rights to develop, you can sell your rights to develop. There's a lot of ways that you could get into this, yeah. So it's essentially an application to, to the, to the development board. Um, you go up to the board and you say, Hey, look, um, I have this project and it, it's going to be hard if you don't have a good claim, right? You can't just go and say, look, I like this block. I want to build houses and make me the developer. Doesn't always work like that. For the most part, it'll be like, look, I own like 50% of the houses here. I want the right to be the exclusive developer here. That way, no other developer sees that you're buying 50 and then they want to come and buy and then try to flip it to you, right? What they do is you, you become the developer for the area and then you try to work it out with the individual homeowners, but they, you're the only one that can do that. Another way is like, let's say you have uh, like Jersey Gardens, for example, that was Simon Properties, like they're the big mall properties. They wanted the premier mall company to build that mall. They didn't own any of the property, but they made them the exclusive developer because that's what the city wanted. That is another argument, but it's very hard to do that. If you don't own any of the property, it's very hard to be the exclusive developer, but there is a way to do it too, okay? Questions on any of this so far? Okay, I'll move through. Um, zoning and consistency. This is one of the biggest things. When you're looking at what's allowed and what's not allowed. Like some people will call me and be like, oh, I wanna buy this one family house because I saw the next door is a two family. Even though it's a one family zone, I want to put a two family. And people think that that's how it works. That's not always how it works. 
Elizabeth, for example, was very strict on this. What they started doing is, yes, they want to keep conformity, but they want like 90% of the block to be what you want it to be. So let's say there's one, one family house and the rest of the block is two families, then you will be granted the zoning variance to do that as a two family. But if you're not at 90%, like let's say it's half and half, it doesn't matter that the rest of the houses, you can have a two family or left, two family or right, two family across the street. If the rest of the block is not conforming, they won't give that to you, right? They, they're, they're stricter. Some places might just say, no, you know, it's good enough if you have one and two and then the others are normal. Yeah, we'll do that. It's really up to discretion of the board. Rosa Park, is that a strict for that? Uh, Rosa Park, we're not as, uh, look, by, I, I, the appropriate answer is uh, we look at everything on a case by case basis. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but what I, what I will say is that um, it depends on the vision of the board and the mayor. Like we want certain development. Um, so we can pick and choose when we're more lenient based on if it's certain. And it also depends on when you come. So let's say you came to Roosevelt Park three years ago and you want to do a two family. For the most part, if there's other two families, we'd probably say yes. But now that we're having all these apartment buildings, we might say no to the same application we would have said three three years ago, yes to. But if you have something specific, we'll talk about later. Yes. You know, so, uh, <laughs> but yeah, that's pretty much that. Um, so any consistency with the master plan, that's essentially saying like, you want to try to keep everything in mind. Um, the amendments, if, if you want to change certain groups, the zoning map and the zoning uh, zones, they can be changed at any moment. So let's say that the, the city hall decides, you know what, no more developments here. Like we, we're done with it. You can amend at any given time. They don't have to wait 10 years to change it. So at any moment, your zoning plan can be, can be amended. So be mindful of that too, because what you knew, maybe you knew that that's how they did things three years ago. If you're not keeping up with it, you don't give, don't tell somebody, oh yeah, you could do that. Three years ago, we did that because you don't know if something's changed in between. All right. So that just keep that in mind. Um, the biggest factors to take into account, this is kind of what I was getting at, the character of the area. The number one thing I look at when I have an application in front of me is, will this application change the character of the area? If the answer is yes, then I'm probably going to deny it because that's the goal is you want to preserve the character because it's unfair to people that bought properties there. If you then come in and completely change it, right? Their houses might lose value and it, it's really, you know, you're, you're doing a detriment to people. Um, appropriateness of the particular use district to alternate districts. This is a very important thing. This is kind of that question about 55 and over, right? where I was saying, you're not going to build a 55 and over community right next to a nightclub because that's not appropriate. It's not the best use of that area. That's a factor for you to consider. Uh, and then the other things is boundaries of the use district. What does that mean? Perfect example, I'm doing something over here where it's right on the border, like the zone ends at my property. If I was in the next block over, what I wanna do is allow, but I'm here, so it's not. But I'm an applicant now and I'm looking, look, I'm right on the border. So it's not too big of a deal for you to carve this little section out because you're right on the border of that use. So that's also important. If you're looking at something and it's a two family and it, that's right where it ends or like a block away from where it ends, that's a very important factor for why you might get approved for your application. So the, to me, these three things are the most important things. If you wanna help your client, understand that these are the three things. As long as it doesn't change the character of the area, as long as it's an appropriate use to that site, and if you're close to the district, those three arguments, you're almost guaranteed to win your, your argument. So keep those three things in mind. Um, subdivision and plan. I might not get into this so much right now, but a lot of us are looking at subdivisions. Like I sent out a deal recently with those nine lots. That was like a big property. It, he owned that big property and he went and pretty much carved it out like a pizza and said, I could do nine lots here. And they're not all uniform, but if you carve it out so that it works, you do a subdivision. A lot of people make a lot of money subdividing lots. You don't have to even build it. And the subdivision is not a physical subdivision. It's a legal subdivision. You do a survey and they start drawing it up. If you get that subdivision approved, your property can be exponentially increased in value. And then you could sell it like that and somebody else can build on it. All right, you guys understand what I mean by that, right? Um, I'm not gonna get into that, but I will say one thing you gotta bear in mind when you subdivide, it's not just about you. If you're creating any streets inside of your property, that might just be a private street. And now you might have to have kind of like a HOA setup where somebody has to pay for the maintenance of that street. So every, pop, every property on that block has to then do additional expenses to maintain the street. And maybe the city won't even do your waste collection, right? Because the city already pays for the main city. If you're dividing a two acre lot, 
you might have to be responsible for maintenance of that. So if you're creating a new street, that's a negotiation that has to happen with the city as well. Is the city going to maintain it? Are they going to plow the snow? Are they going to pick up the garbage? These are all factors. So if your client says, oh, I want to subdivide this, say, oh, let's, let's see if the city will pay for the, that's like, you, just with that one suggestion to your client, you're adding a lot of value because they probably never thought about that, right? So that's another important factor with this. Um, utilities. I worked on a project in South Brunswick, 14 acres, huge property. Um, you guys know Kehovian, the, the developer of homes are huge across the, the country. They bought a development to do there. They don't know how it happened. The consultant local might have not figured it out. They had no way, because it was right on route one and the utility connect was on the other side. They had no way to connect their utilities to the main line. And there's no way you're gonna build a hundred homes and have to put in septic systems in 2020. Right, that's not going to happen. So the utility is one of the biggest things. Because if you can't connect to the main system, you might be asked out. So what they ended up having to do is they sold it to my client, and my client did a deal with a development that was behind. So the closest was actually right in front. They actually did a deal with the one that was behind to cut through their system and connect to the street that was further. So there are ways to get creative, but sewer. Utility, water lines, electric. Electric's not such a big deal. You can usually run it overhead. They prefer to do it below ground now, but sewer is like the biggest one. If you can't get a sewer connection to the public system, nobody wants to buy a property with septics. Not, not when it's not required down here, you know? So keep that in mind. Um, minor, minor and major subdivisions. I'm not gonna get too much into the, the, the nitty gritty, but um, essentially everything's gonna require a site plan. So you guys might've seen site plans. They're essentially like a survey and they show you what you want to do. That's a basic site plan, right? Then you have the actual construction plans with elevations and the, the renders and stuff like that. Those are two different things. When you're doing a subdivision, you only need a site plan. You don't actually need the full blown plans. So right now I have a lot for sale in Union and they the client was going to get full plans and they were going to pay an architect like five Gs to develop plans for, for a new construction home, but they didn't want to build it, they wanted to sell it. And I explained to him, you don't actually have to do that. All we have to do is get a site plan, which is a survey and the drawing and get approvals to build within these confines. You don't have to do the full thing. So it cost us 600 as opposed to 5,000. I got the zoning approval and now we're gonna sell the zoning approval. And whoever's gonna build it, they could do their own thing. So I saved them three months and five Gs, just like that. They love me, right? So that, that's the idea. If, if you're armed with that knowledge, you can get a lot more value for your clients. Um, so site plans are different than full plans. Um, purpose of the subdivision, we don't really need to get into that too much. Um, the contents is very important. This is stuff that you guys might not consider sometimes. Um, procedures for preliminary and final uh, approvals. Sometimes your site plan might have to go through both boards. If you have to go to planning board and zoning board, you better have full support of your mayor and whomever because somebody on that board is going to have a problem with it. I'll tell you, you know. So if you have to go through multiple boards, be prepared to have local support on max all right um design the design standards are very important they have to deal with how you're going to build the house there are design standards for home builds you can't just say okay i'm going to build a one family house and build whatever the hell you want and build a straw hut right there are design standards so you have to be in mind like if somebody wants to come and say yo i want to do this crazy like that dome house that just went for sale you can't just get a lot and build a dome house in the middle there are design standards for these things so if your client comes to you and I say, I want to do this crazy house and, you know, I fit all the setback criteria, that might not be enough. You have to look at the design standards for that municipality. The other thing, which is the biggest one is RSIS. It's the worst four letters you can hear as a developer. It's uh, residential standards, um, IS, uh, something, essentially the parking requirements and it goes by bedroom counts. So if you have a one bedroom house, they want you to have one, Point three parking spots per one bedroom. If you have a two bedroom house, you need to have 1.9. If you have a three bedroom, it's 2.3. Whatever it is, essentially, let's say you want to build 10 townhomes and some are two bedrooms, some are three bedrooms, that impacts the amount of parking you need. So it's not like I'm building 10 houses, I need two spots per house. That's not how it works. It's actually by bedroom. So RSIS is important. Most developers only put in studios, one bedrooms and two bedrooms, because if you start throwing in three bedrooms, it changes your parking ratio is much higher. So this RSIS is like a nightmare for most developers. And this is a statewide thing. There's really no way to get a, a, away from it. The only thing is if you're doing mixed use, some cities allow you to get away from the state stands because it's no longer just residential. 
So that's a trick. Actually, I had a client, we were developing something and his parking requirement was going to be pretty high. What I suggested was that we put on the ground floors, uh, a pharmacy. And then now it makes it a mixed use development, not a residential development. And it changed our parking criteria. So we were able to get more units as opposed to the way he was trying to do. It. So again, this is how you add that value to your clients is by figuring these things out. Um, Reservation of open space, sometimes that's required, especially if you have some wetlands protection, things like that. Grading, one of the biggest things you could deal with is grading. I mean, we all know that we want water to flow away from a house, but when you're dealing with development, you don't want that water to flow away from your property and onto somebody else's property. So grading is a very important thing to keep in mind when you're going to do planning, uh, especially in flood prone areas, like that's a huge thing. Um, I'll speed through here. Any questions about anything else here? I know it's very dense information, so I don't really want to get into all of these specifics. I'm probably going to cut it there and move into the portion that actually looks at how do you look at somebody's um, uh, zoning requirements. Um, but yeah, I, I'm not, I think we're, that's a good spot to cut it. Anything specific that you guys want to know about land use that I didn't cover here? No? Okay. So uh, the last thing I'll say is the composition, like I was telling you guys, it's either seven or nine members. Uh, usually for zoning, it's seven and for planning, it's nine, because if you have a joint board, the people that are elected officials, they can't be on it. So normally you end up with, with less, um, but there are classes of, of members, um, not that any are more important, but these are just the way that the law wrote them out. So class one is always going to be the mayor or the mayor's designee. So the, the mayor by default has a seat on the board because they, they have a, a, you know, a say in it. Class two will be an official from the municipality that is not an elected official. And that's usually the construction official. The city normally wants the construction official who deals with the permits to have an input on the board. And that's really useful because a lot of times you have technical questions that the construction official gets to answer. Uh, class three members is a member of the governing body. So a councilman, typically a councilman gets appointed to sit on this board and, and you have that influence. And then class four is really your general public. Class four are citizens appointed by the mayor. And then you also have alternates. So you have up to four alternates on every board where if you have seven people show up and you need nine and you have two of your alternates, they can step up and be there, but they're not necessarily full members. They only get to vote on some meetings when somebody's absent. <clears throat> and then as far as elected positions, uh, every board has a chairman, a vice chairman and a secretary. Those, those are the three categories that you'll have. Um, and we're the ones that sign the stuff and actually do the procedure of the meeting. Um, so that's pretty much the composition of anything. If, if you guys are interested in, in joining a board, like I said, we'll, we'll go through that. Um, any questions now? No? George, I have a question. Yeah, what's up? Is it true that for the purpose of developing a corner lot, let me go back, a corner lot is um, a lot easier to work with? Um, because of, because it has, you know, double access, I guess, you know, two separate streets. Is that, is that the case or no? It could, but it could also be, it depends on really the size of the lot, because if you have a small corner lot, that might actually be worse because your setback on each side is usually big. Normally your front setback is like, let's say 25 feet and your side setbacks are like five or 10 feet. If you have a corner lot, they might ask you to have 25 feet from this and 25 feet from that. So you actually shrink the usable space. And why? It's because of what's called the site triangle. If you're driving up to a street and you have a corner building that's built up to the, to the edge and you can't see around it, you could cause accidents. So when I get a corner lot application, the biggest thing we come and ask is for site triangle. You want to make sure that you can see across to the other side. So the corner lot might be a detriment to you because you have two frontages that are going to require more setbacks. Um, but when it comes to access, if you're building... Uh, let's say you're building like on a state route, like route one and nine, I have a corner lot right now. And there are two apron cuts, meaning accesses. That is a huge benefit to us because now we can create entrance from one street and exit through another. And that allows our circulation to look better. So there, in that case, it was a good thing, but also that lot is like 28,000 square feet. Um, so that we're not too concerned about having the, the, the side triangle. So again, it's like every question with land use, it's like, yes and no. That's- And that's last, last question. Yeah. Last question. Now, what about, uh, you know, being on a county road versus a regular road? Yeah, so um, county road, the only thing is that you now are subject to the county planning board as well as the local planning board. 
So when you come to me on my planning board in Roosevelt Park, we might approve you for what you want to do, but now you have a second board to deal with, which is the county board, and they might not. So it, it, it creates another layer of it. I will say, at least in Union County, the Union County board really just defers to the local. Like if the local board is okay with your project, they'll typically say good, unless there's like really traffic is the only thing that, that they might care about. Um, and any other questions on that? No, that's it, man. Thank you. I will say this, um, without, without going in, let me just close this out. Without more of the, uh, of the presentation, I will say that with boards, one of the biggest things you could do is talk to people, right? We're, we always talk to clients and everything. You guys should start talking to zoning officers. Zoning officers are employees that work for the city and they kind of enforce what the zoning board puts out. So if I'm, a, I'm the zoning board and I make a new regulation, the zoning officer is that day-to-day -day employee that deals with those regulations. So if you have a question, you can always call the city zoning officer and ask them questions and they know the stuff in and out. They'll help you. That's, that's what they're there to do. Um, but don't ask them like, hey, can I build this 10 story building in this zone? Because they don't know about that. They only enforce the rules that are written. If you're trying to change the rules, you have to go to the zoning board itself. When you talk to a zoning member individually, some cities are different than others. For example, in Roselle Park, we are more of an autonomous board. We get to really kind of decide. Very rarely will the mayor get involved or anything like that because they're not supposed to. But in some cities, and I'm not going to say which ones, nothing happens in a zoning board without the mayor's approval. They're very controlled. So even if you talk to a zoning member and they say, yeah, I like this idea. If you didn't get the approval from the mayor, forget it. Your position means nothing. So it's very important to understand where you're working because every municipality is, is different. And, and when you are going to advise your client, don't rely on the textbook because it's definitely not enough when it comes to zoning and planning. Questions on that? All right. So I think what I'll do is I'll, if you guys want to stay on the Zoom, we could do it. I'm probably going to stop the recording, but I'm going to show an example of how do you develop, how do you do a site plan or how do you look at a property and say, okay, what can we build here? All right. Um, so I'll leave it here. If, every, if anybody wants to hop off or if you want to stay and, and watch this, you, you definitely can. Uh, his hand was up from before. I don't think he ever put it down. All right, I'm going to share my screen again. All right, so I'm going to show you guys a quick thing. So if you are looking to develop something, um, let's say it's here in Raleigh, um, you always want to start with the city of like the city's website. So let's go to cityofbroadway.com in this particular example. Um, and the main thing you want to do is you go to either government and you look for the department or you look for the boards. Um, so in this case, you have planning boards right here. You have zoning board of adjustment. You normally click on that. And then for the most part, they'll have agendas or meetings. They'll tell you, look, every third Monday of the month, they meet at 7 p.m. And here's the location. So that's a good way for you to know. Um, but if you're trying to find the actual uh, requirements, you normally go to search for what's called the municipal code. So I don't know if you guys know the difference, but like um, when you have laws for, for the state, they're laws. When they're a local law, it's called an ordinance. Okay. And every city has ordinances. Ordinance is the same thing as a law. It's just that it means it's a local law. Um, and the ordinances are compiled into what's called the municipal code. So municipal code is just the book of laws for your city. And every single city has a municipal code. So you want to find the municipal code. That's where everything's going to be enshrined. So you click on the municipal code. And pretty much every city in New Jersey uses e-code. E-code 360 is like the portal where everybody uploads their, their ordinances. It's very searchable, downloadable. It's very easy to use. So if you use here, um, number one thing is you're going to uh, scroll down and you're going to look for zoning. You either search it or you scroll there's a there's a ton of codes there's different laws for everything but there's usually a section called land use regulation and it's called land use because it's how you're allowing people to use the land right when you go here you click on zoning and there's a lot of things on here what we're looking for this one has an attachment this is the schedule of lot height and yard requirements this is very important because this is what's going to tell you what those requirements are in different cities. I'll come back to this in a second. What I'm going to look for too is I'm going to look for the establishment of zones and the actual zoning map, right? So sometimes it's uploaded on here, 
And sometimes it's an attachment and sometimes you got to look for it elsewhere. I know that raw ways was a little hard for me to get. So I ended up saving it. Some cities have it readily accessible. Like you can Google it like Elizabeth. If you put Elizabeth zoning map, they actually have an interactive one. It's called GIS. And when you go on their map, it's uh, you can actually type in the address and you'll be able to pull up the property. In Florida, it's like that. They have a system where you can actually pull everything up. So look, this is the map. And if I want to look up a specific property, you could zoom right in and let's just find like this one right here. You find the plat right up here. It says the information. Oops, right here. So right here, you'll, you'll have all the information for the block, the mail, the, the uh, Gov Pilot is the system they use. You can find a ton of information on it. Um, here it says the county, the ward. So this is the fifth ward. All this stuff is right on there. Raw is not there yet. So like you would normally have to Google raw zoning map. And I've been able to find it. There's um, let's see if they have it. If not right here, raw rising is uh, it's a newspaper that covers uh, raw So you can pull that and download it right there. And you can see all of those things that I was telling you guys about the zones are like B2, R2, all that stuff. Like it's all, it's all coded here. If you go to the bottom, you can see down here where the key is, but if you can't pull up the, if you can't pull up this key, let's say we're located in a B2 zone, right? I found a property for sale. It's right here. It's in a B2 zone. I go back to the establishment of zones and I look for B2. So the list of zones is right here. B2 is the regional business zone. And that might be different than B1, which is the neighborhood business zone, right? You might allow convenience shops in a B1 because it's mixed residential, but you're not gonna allow supermarkets in a B1 because that's too heavy of a use. And that's up to every municipality to determine. So what you could do from there is you could go back and let's look for the B2 and see what's allowed, right? There's also terms defined. You can say like, oh, I wanna do a cool like restaurant, but lounge, but it's not a club. You can call it whatever you want. It doesn't matter what you call it. You have to look at the definitions that the city puts out because they might say a club is anything that has a bar and 5,000 square feet. So even though you might not call your stuff a club, if you fit their definition of a club, you are a club. Okay, so that's important because I have clients that, that do that and they don't understand that. So you have to be able to show this and, and be able to pull that up for them. Um, for example, look, an attic right here. A lot of people think things are attics, but like if it's a certain height, maybe it's not. Well, look, an attic is the part of the building which is immediately below and wholly or partly within the roof framing. So you could have a third floor and nothing above it. And that third floor is not an attic because it's not the attic immediately there. So there's a lot of things where you have to look at the definitions. So make sure you don't skip that part. Let's go back and pull up that B2. So we're looking at the zoning regulation and we're looking for establishment of zones. And then we're looking for B2, B2 regional, regional business zone. Right here, black and, black and gray. Permitted principal uses. The following principal uses are permitted. One, convenience retail stores, specialty or comparative retail uses, personal services, shopping centers in accordance to provisions of this article, restaurants, including driving, blah, blah, blah. It gives you a list of what is permitted. So if your client says, I want to put a restaurant, you pull up the property, find the zone in the zoning map, then go to the ordinance, and find what the approved use is, and it'll be right there in black and white. Super simple. Sometimes, if it's something very specific, it could be harder, but for the most part, they're all defined here. When it says professional offices, right? Go to the definitions and see what they determine as professional offices. Some people define it differently. Some people might say um, dentist office is a professional office, but some municipalities might call those medical offices, right? So that is definitely also important to, to consider. All of those things are right there. There's also a section called permitted accessory use. I didn't talk about this too much because this is nitty gritty, but on a lot, you can no normally have multiple structures. Most municipalities in one family zones will limit you to two structures, one principal and a second accessory. Most houses are primary home and then a garage. And then there are different regulations for the size of your primary structure and your secondary structure. For example, some people don't think that they need a permit for a shed, right? But zoning regulation will tell you an accessory structure that exceeds a seven by seven, not more than one is allowed. So if you want to have three sheds in your backyard and they're 10 by 10, technically you're breaking zoning. <laughs> yep, absolutely. And you will, like, when you go to sell the house, that might be an issue. 
Some people don't think that you need a zoning permit for paper blocks. <laughs> you do. Because if you cover more percentage of your lot with impervious coverage, you're affecting the coverage of your lot. Yeah. How often do they find stuff like that? So they typically don't check for it in most municipalities, but if you get an a-hole neighbor that calls and says, hey, this guy's doing this, and the city comes in, and because they got called in, they have to act on it. And if you are breaking the zone regulations, you have to act on it. Sometimes for COs, when you're doing the resale, that's one of the things that they check. Some cities check, some don't. Like um, Piscataway, for example, they do fire and they have a CO that's super intense and they check all the zoning. But other municipalities uh, like South Plainfield, you just fill in a paperwork and they give you a certificate that never comes to the house. So sometimes they'll check at that point, sometimes they don't. Sometimes when they do reassessments, like if a city's doing a reassessment of the thing, they'll they'll hire the appraisers to come out and they'll tell them, take pictures and send them to the, the zoning office. And the zoning office reviews to see what's on there. Oh yeah, it's bad. It, it, it could get bad. So be mindful that there's a lot of things that even on your regular, not even development deals, zoning affects it and people might not think it, you know? So I, I know people that throw up above ground pools. You're not supposed to do that without a permit. Sometimes it requires a zoning permit and a construction permit. And it's not just a fine, right? Oh, sometimes it's a fine. For the most part, they won't give you a fine. If you just really didn't know, they're not really gonna just straight out come out and fine you they'll tell you, hey, you need a permit for this. Like, I don't know, most people don't know this, but you need a zoning permit for a fence, right? Because you're actually building a barrier. I've had houses where people don't do permits and they built the right in a straight line, right? But the lot comes off. That happens in my mom's house. Yeah, and people she think- She built a, a dike with a above ground pool and she covered like the Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So she had to, and I told her I wanted yeah. to make sure you make yeah. And, and you don't want to be the realtor that your client says, yo, I want to put up a ah, go ahead. Like, yeah, you know, nobody checked. you don't want to be that person because then if they get busted. You're the one that said that. Right. So it could be very expensive. Yeah. Like, it you be very... Replace the fence, like, like one of those, and then just put the, if you're replacing, replacing if you're replacing a fence um, and you're keeping the posts for the most part, you're okay. Cause you're just repairing or replacing the replace. Okay. If you're checking, taking out the post and technically you need a, a permit. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's, but it's, there's a good reason. There's a lot of times where things get missed and things get done the wrong way and it could be a big problem. Yep. No, I, I had a house where they built the fence in a straight line. They, somebody bought the house. They didn't realize that they like the property actually went out that way. Crazy stuff can happen. So advise your clients. Okay. Call the zoning officer and ask. Yeah. Can someone purchase it? Give it a yeah. Yeah. So actually I sold a house in Roosevelt Park that the driveway was three feet into the neighbor's property. Mo, it's actually diagonal from your house on West Webster. It was three feet onto the property and they went to like almost get to closing. They sold the survey there and then the attorney realized, oh crap, your driveway is partially. Every time you drive on your driveway, you're trespassing because you're stepping on the neighbor's property. So what we had to do is we had to postpone the closing. And my client had to buy that sliver of land. The neighbor didn't even know that that was on their property because they did it without a, a permit. But they ended up purchasing that sliver of land. I think they paid them like 50K for, it was like three by, it was like three by a hundred. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I did another development in Elizabeth. Yeah, bro. I did another development in Elizabeth where it was a, it was a vacant land and we paid like 280 for it. It was a piece of land that was attached to it that they couldn't even do anything for themselves. They couldn't do anything themselves because it was an under, undersized piece of land. But for us, it squared out our project. They paid 280 grand for that little piece. These are all important things. And like, if you don't know what you're looking out for, it could cost a lot of money. Yeah. So um, again, just, it tells you here now, as almost as important as permitted uses is the prohibited uses. So if you look here, if you scroll down, there are also conditional uses. For example, here it says the following uses shall be permitted in B2, provided they meet the conditions in Article 7. So automotive, uh, automobile uses in accordance with a separate thing. So sometimes, for example, cannabis right now is usually a conditional use where there's the, the zoning board says, you know what, we're going to allow cannabis here, but with these conditions. So yes, it's allowed, right? The use is allowed, but you have to meet certain criteria. 
And normally it's like, you have to be 500 feet away from a school. You can't be, you can't advertise like a leaf. Like there's, there's all these conditions. So it's important to know permitted, conditional and prohibited. Because here's the thing, if your use is not listed in permitted use, it's technically not allowed, but you can do an application to the zoning board to allow you to do it. If your use is in the prohibited use, don't even bother because they went out of their way to say no already. And then you're coming in and it's like, look, I know it's prohibited, but like not only is it not permitted, not only is it not conditional, but we already said it's prohibited. If it's on the prohibited, it's almost as important to know that as, as the approved. So you'll see here, like they don't want hotels and motels. They don't want hookah lounges. They don't want utility installations. Like all these things are very specifically spelled out on there. So this portion is pretty much like if you have somebody that wants to buy something, you search the area, you look at it on the map, you see what zone it is. Then you go to the code, you look up the regulations for that specific zone. And then let's say it is permitted. The next step is you got to get the bulk variances, the table. So that's what I downloaded here. It's called Schedule A in, um, in Rawway, but it, be, it could be called different things. This is where they look, you look at, let's say we're looking at B2. B2 general business zone. And then the use is for shopping centers, yada, yada, yada. It tells you right here, the minimum lot dimension has to be 30,000 square feet. So there are also bulk variances where just because you're allowed to do it, if you don't meet the bulk variance, the bulk requirements, you might need a variance. But these variances are easy to get or easier to get than a use variance. Because for example, let's say you have a lot and it's only 25,000 square feet and you want to put a restaurant. The code says that you can't do it unless you have 30,000 square feet. But if you come to the zoning board and you're short 5,000 square feet, but you can make a good argument that this is going to be good for the neighborhood, they'll probably grant that to you. So you guys see there are like higher levels of variances. Yes. Um, you don't have to like pay for a variance, but there are fees associated with variances. Um, you, there's an application fee. There's a review fee. You have to pay like an escrow because the city, the city has to review your application and the city hires a planner and an engineer to go through your application. So you have to pretty much cover those fees. So like when I was doing my application, they asked me for a $5,000 escrow. So I put the escrow in and then based on how complicated my application is, the engineer might spend three hours looking at it. They might spend 30 hours looking at it and then they'll draw from the escrow like that. So yes, there are costs associated with it, but it's not like a set fee. For the bigger ones, it could be very expensive. If you own a property under an LLC, you need to hire an attorney to do your application. If you own the property as a person, you can appear on behalf of yourself. So if you're trying to do, I just had a, a couple come to the board. They were trying to do a front porch extension. They, you know, mom and pop, you know, regular people, they wanted to do that. They came before us and it's a way different application because they have no idea what the procedure is. So it's harder for us as a board because there's no professionals presenting. It's just mom and pop doing it. So it could be harder, but it, it does happen. They still have fees, but they're not as big as, as another one. Um, so 30,000 square feet, that's the minimum area. That we also say that the front has to be 100 feet and the depth has to be 200 feet. But again, if you're like 150 deep, maybe you'll get that variance. That's not a hard ask. You know what I mean? These are the types of things that I like. These are called C variances because they're, they have to do with the bulk chart, whereas the use variance is a D variance. Getting a C variance is much easier than getting a D variance just by, by nature. Um, and then you also have yard dimensions. So the front yard has to be 40 feet back. The one side has to be 20. You have to have a combined of 50. There's a lot of very specific things. So this is how you analyze it. And then what I typically do, I'll do like the area of it and I'll measure out. And I build what's called a building envelope. So my building has to be 30,000 square feet. The front has to be 40 foot back, 20 on one side and 50 combined. So I might design this to be 25 on both sides or 20 on one side and 30 on another. You understand? Because it has to add up to 50, but at least one, they have to be at least 20. So you could do 30 or 25 and 25. And what I do is I build a building envelope and I tell my client, this is what you can build on, X amount of square feet. And based on that, you do calculations for parking, for units. It's a process. It's, it's not something you're gonna get immediately, but if you start looking and understanding this, you could really service your clients better. Any questions about any of this stuff? You got your yard dimensions, you got your heights, you got the coverages. Look, this one right here talks about you can't cover more than 35% with your building. And then for impervious, you can't cover more than 80%.
So they say your building can't be more than 35%. So let's say it's 100,000 square feet. You could build on 35,000 square feet for the building. And then your parking lot can have the extra space up to you get to 80%. So those are also two different numbers that you, you factor in. Yes. It's the construction official that creates this. It's the zoning board. Zoning board. The zoning board puts those requirements. Um, and I'll tell you why it's different zone to zone. Um, let's say that we have a flood area. In that flood area, as a zoning member, I'm going to want the impervious coverage to be less because I want the drainage to be more. But if it's on a higher area where there's not a lot of flooding, I might allow more coverage because it doesn't affect the runoff. Right. And like we were talking about before, you could do storage tanks below to kind of offset that. So there's a lot of nuance to it, but this is how you find the information out. Any questions? Not, I think I'll, add, I'll end it there. There was a lot of stuff. We'll definitely do a more advanced one if you guys want to get into that. But, uh, you know, thank you guys for coming and uh, I'm going to wrap up here. Thank you for your time. Very informative. Thank okay. you. I'm glad you liked thank it. You. Take care. Have a good one, guys.